heart that hurts I want to spend my life Mending broken people I want to spend my life Mending broken people Hello, my precious friends. Thank you so much for joining us today and allowing us to come into your living room. Thank you for that. And also, I wanted to just take a minute to thank you for the years of support, your love, your prayers, and your financial support of 3ABN. If it wasn't for you, this ministry would suffer severely. But because of you, we are able to reach the whole world with the undiluted messages of Revelation 14. Thank you so much for allowing us to be your friends and to work with you. Uh, we have an amazing program today. We have got, uh, I've got two guests and, and this is the truth. They have absolutely been sitting here bubbling over. They just can't <laughs> wait to get to the subject. And our subject today is what, Pastor Lo McCain? The right action of the will. The right action the of right the action will. right action of the will. We're gonna answer a number of questions and we're gonna end, we're gonna hold it on to the very end, uh, how to know the will of God and how to accomplish it. But the right action of will is what this program is all about. And Dee Casper, you are the evangelism director, I believe, of Unseen Media Group. Thank you so much for being with us. And Pastor Lon McCain, I didn't introduce you. Everybody knows you. You're the pastor of the Thompsonville Seventh-day Adventist Church right here in Southern Illinois. That's right. And we That's just right. love and appreciate our pastor. Dee, tell, tell me a little of what you do at Unseen Media before you talk to us about the will of God. Sure. So our our ministry is basically seeking to make content to reach young people that's principled and Christ-centered uh, for social media to basically permeate social media with the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, part of what I do as the evangelism director is we run a school of evangelism as well. We're training our young people in filmmaking and in evangelism. So I teach the Bible classes, I preach on behalf of the ministry, and uh, do a lot of the networking and stuff on behalf of the ministry as well. Well, this is an exciting subject that we are presenting today. We're going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, the will, uh, how we submit our will, the purpose of our will, so many aspects of our will that we want to look at. But before we look into this, and I'm going to come back and I'm going to ask this question, just what is the will? And I'm going to have Pastor Lo McCain and Dee delve into this. But before we look into this subject, let's ask Mary Grace to come and she's going to play a beautiful song on the piano. The name of the song is It Is Well With My Soul.
she always just amazes me. She yes. does such a wonderful job on that piano. Amen. Thank you, Mary Grace, very much. Well, the, our opening question is, what is the will? And so, Pastor Loma Cain, I know that you want to jump into that one. So first, let's look at what the will is. Well, in a simple, forthright, direct uh, answer, the will is the governing power in the nature of man. It's the governing power. I like to use a, an illustration if you had a car with gears, you know, the manual shift. Not, not many people use manual shift today. We call it stick shift. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you get into the car that has a stick shift, you have to choose the gears. You go sequentially. Hopefully you begin with one, two, three, four, five, or six speed, whatever the choice is. But you have to, you have to make a choice. So the will is the governing power in the nature of man. Simply says, uh, which one am I going to choose? And then when you choose the gear, it does what it's designed to do. Mm -hmm. When you make a choice, whether to go left or go right, if you choose to go into the road of life, everything on the road of life is there. The road of death or, 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 or darkness, everything of death and darkness is there. But the choice determines what the following experience is going to be in a simple, straightforward point. So it sounds like um, our will is our choice-making ability. Mm -hmm. Right. D, yeah. um, you want to expand on that? Yeah, it, it's the power of choice is kind of the way that I explain it to people mm -hmm. that when someone exercises their will, they're basically exercising their ability to choose for good, for bad, for whatever else the option may be, but basically the power of choice. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and also what I would add to that is the, 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 the will is not my tastes or my inclinations. You know, some, some, sometimes people say, well, I don't have a taste for that. And sometimes we say, well, you'll develop a taste for that. Uh, our taste is not our, our will. Our inclinations uh, is not our will. But our choice in a simple, straightforward point is uh, what the will is all about. When you, when you use that power to choose, then the outcome is predetermined. Uh, you know, going back, and, and we're going to have a, we're going to get deeply into the program, but I, I like to begin by looking at some examples of the wrong action of the will. You know, we are in the condition we're in today, the whole world, mm -hmm. everyone, we're born into the condition of our world today because of the wrong action of the will. And I think a good place to begin, we, we talked about this collectively, we like to begin uh, to show how the, the great controversy began when Lucifer decided he was not going to put his will on the side of God. So the great controversy, this is where we're going to begin, mm -hmm. began in heaven and it was a great controversy between God and Lucifer, mm -hmm. and it began in the portals of heaven by somebody making, uh, by using their will inappropriately. Yes, exactly. Okay. That's, a, so that's, a, that's an understatement. That's basically the point we were going to make. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm yeah. saying now expand on that. Yeah. Okay, why don't you want to read Isaiah sure. 14, verse 14. So in Isaiah chapter 14, 14 um, we'll begin in verse 12. This is kind of heaven's response to the fall of Lucifer. Mm -hmm. And they're asking a question of sorts. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and the scariest one is the end here. I will be like the most high. Hmm. So he longed and, and, and coveted a position that wasn't his, actually coveting the position of God. Now, he doesn't want the character of God. He wants the position of God. There's a big difference. He's not looking for an other-centered love that he's lusting after. It's the position. It's the power of God. And, it's, and he said over and over, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. He continued to expound, I will. He knew he had a will. See, God created every one of us with this free moral agency. We use that term, which simply means God created every one of you with the ability to decide this is the choice or this is the choice. Free moral agency. God does not force our will. God does not control our will. And I want to make that point clearly even further. We think that God controls our will. No, we have to choose to give God our will. And then it becomes uh, uh, under his control. But he doesn't say, I'm going to take D's will and make him do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. We're not robots. We're not, not automatons. God didn't set us into a particular position. Right. 
and then we kept on doing things. But Lucifer said over and over, and what he did, and there are five points that are brought out here, but what he did, and I brought them down to like about three, he chose not to yield his will to God. And you'll discover any time we fall, it's a moment of choice. Whatever the temptation is, it's a moment of choice. And we consciously choose to not yield our will to Christ. The next thing we do, uh, when we choose not to yield our will to Christ, we then choose to oppose the will of God. Mm -hmm. I don't want that. I, I'm opposed to that. The other thing we do is, uh, which Lucifer did, then the outcome of our choice is distorted. Because I really don't believe, and we could expound on this together, I really don't believe that anyone makes a choice thinking uh, that this choice is going to end in my death no. or in my destruction right. or in my failure. And so what Lucifer did in all these ascending, uh, the wrong action of the will, he said to us, uh, results in an exalted state. He told that to Eve. But it results really in a fallen state. He also made, made it, uh, the, the wrong action of the will does not result in the seat of your choice. Mm -hmm. It results in the wrong seat. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing, uh, the wrong action of the will does not take us higher. It always takes us lower. That was the next verse. He says that you will be cast down, even though he, he has, That's right. there's 11 upward words used in that span of like three verses, 11 of them. Mm -hmm. And he has upward ambition in mind at the expense of everyone else. Mm -hmm. But in the end, God's going to bring him down. And that's what actually ends up happening is that reality check. In Genesis 3, Eve had a choice to make, right? right. And the way in which Satan mm -hmm. led her to make the wrong choice was by first giving her false pictures of who God was, her relationship with him, and how God treats her. So by lies being sown into her experience, she then informed her will with lies and made bad choices that led to her demise mm -hmm. uh, that we're still having to contend with now. And what God is trying to do is to speak truth in our experience so that we'll make wise choices. Um, you kind of see that, that competing approach um, carried out in Genesis chapter 3. And, and so, question? Well, uh, we were looking at what is the will. The will is the governing power, our governing power. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that where you are right now, where every one of us are right now, is it in direct relation to us using our will. We have made choices right. that have put us where we are right now. We can't blame anybody else. And um, you made the point that uh, our choices uh, using Satan and Eve mm -hmm. as the example are choices that we think we're making that are going to exalt us. Never once does it cross our mind that our choices that we're making are going to bring us down. But That's these right. two examples, yeah. the end result was Failure. Failure. And both both were rooted in false pictures of God. Somehow Satan, this is why it's called the mystery of iniquity, somehow the person closest to God developed thoughts about God that he's not fair, that someone else is receiving something that I should receive. And it's the same approach that he used with Eve. Both fell in similar ways. Distorted pictures of God led to action against God mm -hmm. and then to their own demise. They exercised their power of choice wrongly and it led to their demise. And you find all through the Bible, even in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 18, Ezekiel 33, where the Israelites keep saying to God, your way is not fair. Mm. Satan has always made it look like God's way is not fair. And, uh, you know, I, I I wish we could like, do a two-hour program on this topic, <laughs> yes. but let's just take the time we have to use it uh, efficiently. Uh, somebody may say, I want to do right, but desire for goodness and purity, if that's all you have, is not using your choice correctly. If desire is all you have and you stop at desire, you don't accomplish what will be for your best good. I want to lose weight, but give me that box of donuts. <laughs> or more specifically, do nothing, even if you don't eat the box of donuts, do nothing to accomplish what you desire. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I, I use these equations, desire plus the wrong actions equal failure. Desire plus the right actions equal success. But desire without action is failure. There's actually a powerful quote on this in Desire of Ages. It sure. says this very thing. It steps to Christ. I said Desire of Ages. It steps to Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, 47.2. It starts with the word desire. Mm -hmm. She says, desires for goodness and holiness are right as far as they go. But if you stop here, they will avail nothing. That's right. 
many will be lost while hoping and desiring to be Christians. They do not come to the point of yielding the will to God. They do not now choose to be Christians. That's right. And that's where the, the shortcoming happens. And in Ministry of Healing, she says also with that quote augmented, she says, they do not choose to serve Him. Uh, this is a powerful concept. Let's go to Joshua 24, 15. Uh, Joshua uh, brings into view the, and a, prof a, profound, a profound example. I've, I've read this text so many times, uh, Joshua 24, 15, and we all know it, you know, choose you to whom you will serve. But in looking at this and with fresh eyes, uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and break this down uh, in, a, in a very realistic way. Joshua 24, 15. Mm -hmm. Okay, it says, and he says, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, there's a word, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. And then he brings out choices, choices of our past. He says, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river, meaning the gods of your past, mm -hmm. your relatives' gods. You know, sometimes people think that, um, that they can't choose another church because this is the church of their relatives. Right. That's, predispos that's predisposed, but we are not predisposed to choose what our parents chose any more than we are predisposed to ride a horse and buggy of our great, great, great grandparents. We choose something different, a modern vehicle. So, so the Lord is saying here through Joshua, you've got to choose to break away from the choices your parents made. So heredity doesn't mean it has to be cultivated. So we can't blame our parents. Then he also says, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, the present situation that you're in. Sometimes you say, well, I have no choice. Look at the kind of world I live in. You do have a choice. He says, you got to choose even the gods in the land of the Amorites. You, you could even choose them, mm -hmm. but you don't have to choose them. You're not predisposed to choose them. You could choose the true God, not the gods of the Amorites. But then he says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, this is an amazing point here. Uh, Joshua didn't say, we will do right. He said, we will serve, serve. the Lord. Mm -hmm. yes. And so often we make righteousness, and I'll look at the camera and say, so often we make righteousness what we do rather than who we serve. We're, we're going to bring this out even more. Yes. So much, so much we say, we, uh, this is what I want to do to be a good Adventist. Uh, this is what I want to eat. This is how I want to dress. This is how I want to worship. Uh, when we're Christians, whatever the denomination, we say, well, here are the things that identify us as good Baptists, good Pentecostal, good Methodists. You know, we have a tenant, a set of tenants we want to live in harmony with. So we choose what we want to do and not want to do, not who we're going to, who we're going mm -hmm. to serve. Exactly. Two entirely different things. Two entirely different things. You know, uh, we want to say something before I go further? Yeah, I was just going to say that here. this idea of, of choice is, is continually found in the scripture. It remind, what you're sharing initially reminded me of Genesis 4 with God and talking to Cain. Right. That God was laying out before him that, you know, <laughs> sin is at the door, but you should have mastery over it. And he makes the point that why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do right, will you not be blessed? And if wrong and so on. But then he says, but if you do well, will you not be blessed? And he goes on and says, um, and if you do not sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. God is letting him know that the exercise of your will can lead you to overcoming in this very moment. And Joshua makes a similar appeal to the people that your situation isn't really the issue here. Right. You can choose right, regardless of what the situation may be. And uh, just Genesis 4 was a reminder that came to my mind from that. You know, it makes me think of the many, many people that are watching 3ABN in countries mm. where being a Christian can cost you your life. And they're having to make a choice by an act of their will, they make a choice that could cost them their lives. They're choosing the Lord Jesus Christ over what uh, their whole, whole history yeah. is about and everybody around them. That's a choice mm -hmm. by an act of your will to serve God. Mm -hmm. And so when, what Joshua said differently than Lucifer, he said, Lucifer chose to serve his own desire. Mm -hmm. He had all the exalted points that he wanted, wanted to focus on, but in the end, no, you'll be brought down. Mm -hmm. And we knew he was cast out as angels were cast out with him. It, it never results in a good end. But Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. There's the word again, we will. He made the choice to direct his will to serving the Lord. And when you serve the Lord, uh, th this is the beautiful thing about when you serve the Lord, I want to use this text more than once because the will of God is unlocked when we decide to serve the Lord. Uh, 
example I could use when you go to a restaurant. We talked about this prior to the program. When you go to a restaurant and you sit at the table, we often refer to the person as a waitress or a waiter. And we refer to ourselves as a customer. But I want to change those designations. The waitress or waiter is the servant. Let me give, get even deeper, the slave. They don't bring to us unless we tell them what to bring. We tell them, what we, we do it politely. We don't say, bring me a drink. And we tell them what kind, what flavor, more ice, no ice, less ice. And we are determined that they bring us exactly what we ask for. And even if they bring us what we ask for and we don't like it, we say, I don't like it. Bring me something else. And they have to because the customer is the, is the boss. The customer's always right. <laughs> always right. And so this happens when you choose to serve the Lord. So they're serving us. In that sense, they're the slave, we're the master. And a person who doesn't get his, a master who doesn't get what he wants will not come back to that establishment. Mm. My wife and I experienced that. Uh, she didn't like her meal. She told the, the waitress picked it up and the manager came and said, what would you like? He said, I have potatoes for the evening and we have a, a squash for the morning. Uh, they're, they're not served together. And she said, I want both of them. He said, done. Because she was the master of the moment. The slave is always subject to the master. So when he said, we will serve the Lord, he put the Lord, no, the Lord, he didn't say we will serve God or the Savior. We will serve the Lord. And what's the word Lord? The landlord, he's the one in charge. I don't want to go too far. Yeah. I was just thinking that when you make the choice to serve God, in that choice comes the power and the ability to serve God. In John chapter 5, Jesus tells the man at the pool of Bethesda, he says, do you want to be made well? And then he tells him to rise, take up your mat and walk. Mm -hmm. And Ellen White quotes and refers to this situation in Steps to Christ when she talks about the action of the will after that. Mm -hmm. But in this particular situation, when Jesus asked the man to rise, take up his mat and walk, he's asking him to do something that isn't possible seemingly. That's right. But by the man choosing to follow what God had asked, mm -hmm. power was provided to him to do what God had asked. Mm. So when we choose to serve the Lord, we receive power from God to serve the Lord. Mm. If that makes sense. Yeah. So with every <laughs> command that we have, when we exercise that power of choice, we receive power to walk in the choice that we had have. Had he laid there on his mat and said, <clears throat> you know that I can't walk, mm -hmm. had by an act of his will, he chose not to do right. what Je he would still, he would have still laid there. Yeah. But he chose by an act of his will, he chose to trust what Jesus had said. Yes. And in so doing, there was the unleashing, uh, unleashing yes. of the power of God for him. Mm -hmm. Look, that's a good point. It's an act of belief. So the yeah. command itself bears within it the power to obey, mm -hmm. but the act of belief secures the power to walk in it. Very so good. we obey and God supplies. Mm -hmm. Yes. Awesome principle. And the word of God is powerful, is sharper than any two-edged sword. By the word of the Lord was the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He spake and it was done. This same power says, get up, if he could create worlds that just hang out there, could he not enable uh, those of us who are afflicted or, or, or are disabled in some area of our lives to get up and walk? Yes. And so many of us think that we say, well, what does God want me to do? He just wants you to believe him. Yeah. He wants you to believe that he can do what he has asked you to do. A lot of people say, uh, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And they think, okay, well now what are the commandments? Mm. And so they want to itemize this righteousness now. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And then, and then he gives you the power to do them. Joshua, and I'll use this text on a number of occasions, but it fits so wonderfully, Philippians 2.13. Mm -hmm. When Joshua said, we will serve the Lord, he put the Lord in charge, the landlord of his life. The landlord tells him what to do and how to do it. But even deeper than that, the landlord comes in and does it. Yeah. For it is God, Philippians 2.13, for it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The thing about it is we, we sometimes say, if I could just figure out the will of God, I'm not jumping ahead of it because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave a hook at the very end. If we could just figure out God's will, we'll do it. And so we pray this prayer, Father, reveal your will to me. Like we say, Lord, reveal yourself to me. And I learned as I continue to study, you know, you can still learn after 30 years. After c continuing to stand God's word, I learned uh, just recently, and I just thank you, Lord, for continued revelation. I learned that God doesn't want to reveal himself to us. He wants to reveal himself through us. We always say, Lord, show us the Father. 
He wants to reveal himself through us, not to us, in the very same way he doesn't want to empower us to do. He wants to be the power that comes in us and does. Mm -hmm. For it is God who works in us both to will and to do and to do of his good pleasure. All right. In Philippians 2, in that same place, mm -hmm. we talked about in Isaiah 14, how Satan wanted to go up, up, up at the expense of everyone else, but God would bring him down. The other side of the great controversy is Jesus exercising his choice. His choice was to become nothing, according to Philippians 2 and verse 6, mm -hmm. who being in the form of God did not consider, I like the NIV version of this particular phrase better, that he didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. Right. Uh, the idea of robbery kind of gets confusing for some folks. But he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name of of every name so that all will bow. So th there's these two opposing views and uh, motives and actions in the great controversy of the exercise of the will. Jesus chooses to lay down aspects of his power to uplift everyone else and at the end he will be exalted above every name. And just continuing in that great controversy theme I think is a powerful example of this and that's what enables us to be able to will and do because he walked and did and continually uh, surrendered his will to his father every step of his life. And how did he become equal with God? He humbled himself. Mm -hmm. And then what did he do? He became a bond servant, another mm -hmm. word for slave. Yeah. He became connected. He linked himself. He humbled himself, said, I'm not going to do it. My father's going to do it. That's why the Lord, that's why God, the father, allowed Jesus to, to, to come in the form of human flesh, mm -hmm. the fallen nature of Adam. Jesus came clothed in that fallen nature of Adam the same weak nature that we all have, but he came to rely on his father. He became a bond servant. Yes. And that's how the power was revealed through him because it was the father working through him. What many people don't realize is Jesus couldn't do anything of, him, of himself. If he did anything of his own source of divinity, his own source, the great controversy would have been defeated because we don't have the same source. Right. But what he did was he used the power of the father. I come to do the will of the father who sent me. Matter of fact, here it is. Uh, uh, Hebrews 10, 7. Behold, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do the will of God, to do thy will, O God. He didn't come to accomplish his will. So here's the, I want to read this quotation in Ministry of Healing, 174 to 176. Mm -hmm. So what happens when we yield our will to God? Through the right exercise of the will, an entire change may be made in the life. What kind of change? Entire by yielding up the will to Christ, we ally ourselves with divine power. We receive strength from above to hold us steadfast, a pure and noble life. A life of victory over appetite and lust is possible to everyone who will unite his weak, wavering human will to the omnipotent, unwavering will of God. Hmm. Isn't that powerful? That's powerful. And, and so we're, we're seeing here that uh, Jesus humbled himself right. and is exalted. Yeah. That's right. Every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going yes. to confess that he is Lord. Satan, who exalted himself, <laughs> what is his end result? He's going to be what, cast down. Cast down. Well, he was humbled. That's, oh, right. that's was, another word I want to use. Yeah. But now we have to bring this home. This program has got to touch the needs of the people That's that right. are listening to it. These aren't just uh, beautiful words for you to hear or new concepts. That's it's right. for us to take to heart. And if you're seeing in your life there is some exaltation uh, today, let's pray and ask God to humble us, right. that God can flow through us. And if you have a desire, if you've said, Oh, I want to be a good person. Today's the day to put your will behind that. That's right. What are some obstacles that could keep us from doing uh, the, the very thing that we're saying that we want to do? I'm thinking about Paul in the seventh chapter of Romans. Romans. Oh. oh, the thing I want to do, that I find out I can't do. That's right. He made it, he made it clear. Paul says, uh, for I know that in me, Romans 7, 18 to 20, for I know that in me that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Yeah. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, you know, I, I, I want to do that, but remember we said desire as far as it goes, if that's all you have, you can't do it. Yeah. I will to do, 
He said, for the good I will to do, verse 19, I do not. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but here's the key, but sin that dwells in me. Now, let me expound on this very quickly. Sin that dwells in me. You see, Adam made a choice. He opened the door to sin. Adam didn't, Adam did not choose to yield to his wife. Adam chose, Adam didn't choose what to eat. Adam chose who to serve. Right. He didn't choose to yield to his wife's suggestion, although he did yield. He ch didn't choose what to eat, although he ate. He chose who to serve. Romans 6, 16. This is powerful. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. I want to make this point very carefully. So for those of you that want to break the things that hold you. Yes. For those of you that are at that point where you say, oh, lust, appetite, greed, anger. For those of you that want to break that thing that's holding you, Paul says, whomever you present yourself to, you become immediately that one slave. Now, the slave and the master concept is powerful because the slave is always subject to the master. Right. The master is never, the Sorry. master never gives up control to the slave. Right. So Paul says here, when you present, you're immediately a slave. You are immediately a slave. So Adam gave all of us this slavery nature. I'm still holding on to the, to the, to the key point I want to make uh, as we come toward the end of the program. So what we have to do is you don't choose what to do. You choose who to serve. Yeah. I am. Um, so the life of Jesus, I think, gives us a lot of answers as to where the power is found. Mm -hmm. Jesus lived a continually abiding and dependent life upon the Father. That's right. Which allowed him to overcome in human flesh. Romans 8 gives the answer to Paul's you know, desperate Dilemma. question, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? The answer is found in the ministry of the Holy Spirit attributing Christ's obedient life to the broken sinner. That's right. Um, so in Romans 8 and verse 1, it says, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, those who are resting in Jesus and receiving his righteousness, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And I'm gonna skip down to verse 3. For what the law could not do, save us, and that it was weak through the flesh, because my flesh can't keep the law by default. That's right. God did on my behalf by sending Jesus in the likeness of sinful flesh and flesh like mine that could have fallen. And on account of sin, Jesus condemned sin in the flesh. He overcame sin in the flesh. And here's why in verse four. And he did that by continually abiding in the Father and receiving strength to make the right decision every step of the way. But this is why he did this. Verse four, so that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. By continually abiding in Christ, by continually receiving power from God, we receive the strength and the power to live the life that Christ lived. Christ lives his life in us, mm -hmm. um, but it's through continually abiding in him that the, the bud, you know, I think Jesus mentioned it in John 15, that you can't produce fruit apart from yourself only if you abide in the vine. Mm -hmm. It's that process of continually surrendering and abiding that we receive power and fruit to overcome. So, so I want to get back to this, uh, and thank you. That, that's so beautiful. Christ is the answer. Right. Uh, I can do all things. But it's only through Christ. Through Christ who strengthens me. We so often say, Lord, I want to do your will. I want to do your will. I want to be a good Christian. Mm -hmm. I want to eat right. I want to dress right. I, and we put this big old I. Lucifer did that. Learn from the one who couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. He put that big I in the way. But I want to go further because I, I mentioned here, when you choose whom you're going to serve, then you start living out their agenda. Right. You go to Burger King, you get one thing. You go to Wendy's, you get something else. You go to McDonald's, you get something else. You go to wherever, you get whatever is there. You can't go to darkness and try to live a life of light. You can't choose light and expect darkness to show up. It just doesn't work. Paul, when he said, that he chose righteousness, obedient, obedience to righteousness or sin to death. When you choose one, the other follows. And so let's go ahead and bring it down. I want to kind of hit this point. And we're going to reemphasize it over and over. Uh, the point is Joshua chose 
not what to do. But who to serve. But who to serve. Right. Now here, I'm going to hit this and we're going to come back to this. And I'm going to emphasize it even further at the end of the program. We cannot choose what to do. You cannot choose what to do. That's the problem. You're saying, I need to give up cigarettes, need to give up alcohol, need to give up pornography, need to give up stealing, need to give up lying. I want to do this. I don't want to do that. I want to do I, 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 I. Joshua chose who to serve. Paul says, this is who we serve. When you choose who to serve and instead of what to do, then the one whom you serve, they choose what to do. Now, going back to slavery, uh, an awful dark spot in humanity on, on so many different continents, including here in America. But God has given me a beautiful picture of slavery because when we choose whom we serve, they choose what we do. They choose what we do. In other words, the slave, the slave never controls the master. The master always controls the slave. Now listen to this text in that context of a good context of slavery. Romans 6, verse 17 to 19. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. In other words, you heard about freedom, so in your heart you desired it. Mm -hmm. Slaves that are bound, they hear about it. Oh, I just can't wait to be free. You obeyed it in your heart, but you, didn't, you were not able to obey it in your actions yet. But look what happened. And having been set free, now you're set free, having been set free from sin, you're a slave all over again. You became slaves of righteousness. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean now? All of a sudden, you're no longer sinning. You find yourself a slave to righteousness, but now this is good slavery because you're doing right, you're not doing wrong, you're living right, you're not living wrong, you're singing right, you're not singing wrong. You're, everything that's right is now a joy in your life because somebody's doing this and you say, how's this happening? It's God who's working in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You let him come in and Paul goes on to say, he says, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. But then he says, for just as you presented your members as slaves, of uncleanness and lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, here's the choice. So now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. So the same cigarette lip, that's the lip that now sings the praises of God. The same hand that turned the wrong channel is the same hand that heals the hurts of others. Your, your instruments, every aspect of your body is now yielded to a different master. And he's the one empowering you to do right. Make a point, D. Um, I was just thinking in my mind. I didn't say make a point. Yeah, yeah. Make yeah. a point, but you know what I Yeah. Saying. So uh, I was just thinking how many of us are wrestling with, yeah, how, 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 right. like theory, theory, but how. The thing that informs the willingness to choose God right. is an encounter with the true picture of God and the love of God, which is manifest in the life, death, burial, resurrection, and righteous life of Jesus. And Jesus says in Jeremiah chapter 31, or it says in Jeremiah 31, that I've loved you with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness, I have drawn you to myself. When we uplift the cross of Christ, a desire awakens within a heart to want to choose God. Because you just wonder, well, how do I choose God? What does that look like? Our first response is to have an encounter with the true gospel. Paul says in Romans 10 that how are they going to receive unless someone preaches? And the whole context of what that gospel should look like is Romans 3 through 8, basically, mm -hmm. 3 through 9 even, of just painting this picture of a suffering Messiah who gave all for a broken humanity who could not restore themselves and who promised for do for man what he could not do for himself. Well, we encounter this amazing grace of God. I would like to serve him. It wouldn't feel like bondage to serve him. Right. It wouldn't feel like legalism or, or slavery to me in, in a negative sense to be a slave of his because I know him. I know he has my best interests at heart and I know he'd never lead me in a way that would not be in my good. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where the uplifting of Christ and all of our ministry can help people to prepare them to make that decision. It says in Revelation 13 and 14, there's these two contrasting views of how people get worship. The devil's looking for worship in Revelation 13 by coercion, manipulation, and death threats. Mm -hmm. trying to deprive people of the ability to choose. What does God do? 
He preaches the everlasting gospel to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And the logical response and appeal to the everlasting gospel is to fear God, give glory to Him, and to rejoice because the judgment has come and you have no need to be ashamed. Mm -hmm. And it causes Babylon to fall and this is what restores us to God. So God gives an invitation by showing His character. Satan tries to malign the character of God and coerce people into worship. And I think that the model that God is using is a model that we should use, and it will lead to people saying, yes, I will choose God. Wow, I, I want to throw something in that's really going to be a hook here. And I say a hook not that because I discovered it, but we are always slaves. That's, a, that's the, yeah. the fact of the matter is we are always slaves. Yes. We, uh, there are two masters. Yeah. We're going to serve one yes. or the other. You will either love the one and hate the other or hold to the one and despise the other. Right. We are always slaves. So people say, well, I, 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 you know, there's no neutral place. So get rid of the idea that you are not a sinner and you're not righteous. You're just trying to figure out which one you are. Mm -hmm. If you choose not to be righteous, you're a sinner. I mean, that is, you're on the road to death. Mm -hmm. We all sin to save by grace. But if you choose not the road of light, you are on the road of darkness. If you choose not to choose the road of darkness, you're on the road of light. We are always slaves. So the beauty of it is, and just going to this again, a slave cannot free him or herself. Now, this is powerful, which means if I become a slave to righteousness, what am I going to do? Righteousness. 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 Because I can't free myself from it. I am a slave to that. Meaning now God is working in me both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Paul says it this way, because we look at the sinful nature, it's no longer I who live, but he says this, because there's one thing we still have left that God is going to replace is the sinful flesh. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing that's still battling with us, the sinful flesh. That's why you have to die every day. You have to choose today. Choose you this day mm -hmm. whom you will serve. I die daily. All right. So that's how you have to do that. Slaves cannot free themselves. Paul says it this way, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. Uh, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Mm. So what do we do every day? Therefore, most gladly, I rather boast in my, in, in my weaknesses and my infirmities. Why? That the power of Christ may rest on me. So when you wake up in the morning, you say, I'm weak, Lord. I am weak, but you are strong. And we sing that song, live out thy life within me, O Jesus, King of Kings. That's what exactly we do. We wake up in the morning and we yield ourselves to Christ. There's a quotation in Steps to Christ. Do you have that one? Which one? Where he says, you know, Lord, I give you my heart. Oh. Take my heart for I cannot give it. Yeah. You know, this beautiful, every day we have to wake up and say, Father, take my heart, I cannot give it. And so, before I wind up on the, on the, the, the slave is always going to do the, the, the work of the master. And that we're continually dependent so that we, we as a people are continually dependent to receive Christ's righteousness, to receive Christ's obedience. We don't create it. We don't procure it with our deeds. That's it's right. something that we're totally dependent upon God to receive. And the fruit of that is obedience, righteousness, and so on. Mm -hmm. You know, you're saying every morning you wake up and and, and how the, the proclamation that we want to make mm -hmm. to God. I'm just thinking of those that are, that, that say, I'm going to get up in the morning and pray. I'm going to get up early in the morning. I'm going to make a proclamation in the morning and then they sleep right through it. Mm -hmm. And then they wake up and instead of doing what they said the night before they were going to do, uh, it's, it's like a battle goes on within you. Pastor, mm -hmm. Have y'all ever had this battle? Yeah. Can, can I go into this? Sure, There's go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. a pot of gold here. <laughs> this is Steps to Christ 47. Many are inquiring, how am I to make a surrender of myself to God? You desire to give yourself to Him, but you're weak in moral power, in slavery to doubt, and controlled by the habits of your life of sin. Your promises and resolutions are like ropes of sand. You cannot control your thoughts, your impulses, your affections, and the knowledge of your broken promises and forfeited pledges weakens your confidence in your own sincerity and causes you to feel that God can't accept you. But you need not despair. What you need to understand is the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the nature of man, the power of decision or of choice. Everything depends upon this. The power of choice God has given to men and it's theirs to exercise. That's right. 
You cannot change your heart. You cannot of yourself give to God his affections, but you can choose to serve him. You can give him your will. He will then work in you to do and to will according to his good pleasure, and thus your whole nature will be brought under the control of the Spirit of Christ. Your affections will be centered upon him, and your thoughts will be in harmony with him. So we can choose to serve him. Mm -hmm. here's, here's the answer to that defeated morning proclamation. When you go to bed at night, you say, Lord, wake me up in the morning. Mm -hmm. You set that yeah. clock. Yeah. Lord, wake me up in the morning so that I can pray. He'll give wake me Christ's you up. Spirit He'll wake you up. Surrender. And then yes. give me the boldness and the, uh, the, the heart to get up and do what, I, what it is that I know. Christ that I had this, do. right? Christ woke up early. Sometimes he would stay up all evenings. You can ask to receive Christ's discipline, mm -hmm. Christ's surrender, Christ's longing to commune with the Father. We can receive our deficiencies through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And that's the mm -hmm. point that she makes. And so when you, when you think about that, and I, I thank the Lord for that, he says, you, you've heard of demon possession or people being mm -hmm. possessed. What happens when we yield ourselves to Christ and we ask him to come in? Here's the quote, temperance 113 paragraph three. Your part is to put your will on the side of Christ. When you yield your will to his, he immediately takes possession of you. Mm -hmm and works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. Your nature is brought under the control of his spirit. Even your thoughts are subject to him. If you cannot control your impulses, your emotions, and your desires, you cannot control the will. And thus the entire change will be wrought in your life. But when you yield your will to Christ, your life is hid with Christ and God, allied to the power which is above all principalities. You have a strength from God that holds you fast to his strength, a new life, even the life of faith is possible to you. So what about knowing the will of God? How can we know the will of God, Pastor Loma Cain? You, you, you know, thought I would never ask. <laughs> <laughs> You want to start with that? I'll, I'll yeah. just head well, I will say this first and foremost. It's when you wrestle with what could the will of God possibly be, we know without a shadow of doubt, the immediate will of God is for you to be saved. That's right. right. Above all else, God wants you to be saved. He wants you to be free, healthy, and whole in Jesus. And so we know immediately that God wants to commune with you, to love you, and to make you like himself. That's the immediate answer that we have. Okay. So the will of God. When we say, Lord, what is your will for my life? What do you want me to do? And we ask, you know, we ask pastors. I've had people ask me. I've had young people ask me. I've had older people ask me. I've had all people of all different races ask me, Pastor John, I've been asking this question. Maybe you know, because I watch you on 3 and Maybe you know the answer. What is God's will for my life? Can you pray with me that God reveals his will to my life? And I said, now let me ask you the question. If God reveals his will to your life, is that eternal life? They said, well, no. I said, what is eternal life? This is life eternal that you may know, mm -hmm. that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus whom you sent. So what is eternal life? To know God and Jesus. An experiential knowledge, not, not a head knowledge, to commune with them, to so think deeply. Yeah. So follow this, to know, to have a connection, an intimate spiritual connection with the Father and the Son. That's, so is eternal life to know God's will? No, it's to know God. So how is that the answer to my question? Does God know his will? Yes. yes. The prayer he taught us to pray, Father, thy will be done on earth as, as it is where? in heaven. So when we get to know God who knows his will because his thoughts and our thoughts are not the same, mm -hmm. when we get to know him, what does he do? He comes in and I yes. go but once again, he comes in to work in us both to will and to do and to do of his good pleasure. So for those of you that are struggling, look at the two contrasts. S Satan says, I will. Jesus says, not my will, but thy will be done. Mm -hmm. He taught us to pray, Father, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So how is God, how is a perfect, a good and perfect will of God going to be accomplished in imperfect men? How is a good and perfect will of God going to be accomplished in imperfect human beings like us? By us receiving him. Who is perfect. Yes. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. So when you receive the perfect Christ, the perfect Christ comes in mm -hmm. and the perfect will he performs through the imperfect man, yeah. thereby making us perfect in the presence of his Father. I, I want to share one scripture. Sure, sure, go for it. And that would be Romans 12, 2. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> You've got it there. Go for it, Molly. Be not conformed to this world but be you transformed, how? By the renewing, renewing of, of your, your mind, mind, that you may prove 
what is that good yeah. and acceptable and perfect will of God. You want to know what the perfect will of God is. That's right. It, it has to do with your mind, doesn't it, Pastor yeah. Loma Cain? And renewing that mind. And what do you renew your mind with? The Word of God yes. and prayer. And, and you would want to naturally do that. When you engage in communion with God and you seek God, the best way to have quality time with Him is in His Word and in your, in your prayer closet. And I want to hit that text again because it doesn't say that you may know what is that good and an acceptable and perfect will of God prove. that you may prove. prove. You know what that word prove means? That word prove means that you may display it because mm. God knows it. He wants to display His will through us, not just say, here, D, here's my will. Check it out. See if you like it. Molly, I'm going to send you an email with my will and see if you like it. If you like it, do it. He says, no, Molly, if you get to know me, I'm going to come in. You know, we, we've got just such a short time and I'm looking at you, D, and you, Pastor Lama Cain. Uh, do you feel like you're in the perfect place in God's perfect will right now in your life? Yes. Yeah. And, and how did that happen? It didn't happen by you working it out or getting advice from somebody else, right. but by you yielding and submitting your life to Him That's right. and allowing Him to direct your path That's right. and direct your steps. He swept me off my feet. Yielded heart. Yeah. Well, we have got to take a short break, and I hate to do that, sure. but I want both of you to be prepared when we come back to give a closing thought and to speak to the hearts of those that are saying, oh, I want to do the perfect will of God. I want to uh, live godly in Christ Jesus. And I want us to have something prepared to help them to make that that step forward. But right now, we've got a, a short, we're going to take a short break, but we'll be right back good information. And now I want us to talk with Dee and with Pastor Loma Cain. They're going to give us some closing thoughts that are going to help us determine how to commit our will to God's hmm. Dee. I want to read a, a brief quote here. This is from the 10th volume of the manuscripts, 175.1. Ellen White was asked by someone who was wrestling with the assurance of salvation, can I be saved? And this was her response. The message from God to me for you is, him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out, John 6, 37. If you have nothing else to plead before God, but this one promise from your Lord and Savior, you have the assurance that you will never, never be turned away. It may seem that you are hanging upon a single promise, but appropriate that one promise and it will be open to you the whole treasure house of the riches of the grace of Christ. Cling to that promise and you are safe. Him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast off. If you present this assurance to Jesus, you are as safe as though inside the city of God. Wow. If you have nothing else to offer Jesus today, but to tell him that you said, if I come to you, you will not cast me out. You can come to Jesus with that appeal. And he promises that you're as safe as though you were inside of the city of God. Amen. And I'll go back to Joshua. You've got to choose today. Wherever you are in your walk with God, wherever you are in your not walking with God, you've got to choose today. You have to say, Father, I choose. This is the right action of the will. A choice. It starts with a choice. I choose to make you the Lord of my life. I choose to serve you. You cannot choose what to do. You can only choose who to serve. When you choose to serve the Lord, God will work in you. He'll come in. He'll work in you both to will and then to do of his good pleasure. Make that decision today. Simply say this, Father, I choose you as the Lord of my life. Come in and work your perfect will in my life. Whom you serve will determine what you do. Make the Lord that choice today. Pa thank you, Pastor Loma Cain, and thank you, Dee. And my prayer for you is that you will make the right choice today. By an act of your will, choose God. Mm -hmm.